Welcome back into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. Sap, uh, game six of the Eastern Conference Finals tonight as the Celtics have a chance to, on their home court, eliminate the Miami Heat and move on to the NBA Finals. We already know who the Western Conference representative is. That will be the Golden State Warriors for the, I believe it's the sixth time in the last eight years. Um, and uh, the Celtics have this opportunity to get over this hump and this door they've been knocking on for a while now. Um, but I, I want to get your thoughts on this uh, right away, Sap. Everybody in Boston and nationally is acting like this series is 100% over, and maybe it's just me as a paranoid Celtics fan. I That sort of talk really freaks me out. Well, I'm here as a non-Celtic fan, as kind of a... <laughs> Impartial observer, you know, Team LeBron. I remain there, even though he's not touched the playoffs this year. Uh, sure. I think the Celtics are going to be just fine tonight. They're the better team. They're healthier. They're on their home court. Miami, I wouldn't say they gave up the other night. It's just that their lack of shooting ability, their lack of talent was on full display in game five as it was in game four. I mean, the last two games when Miami was going into game four, up two games to one, they're starting backcourt of Kyle Lowry and Max Struess. One of 28 right. from the floor, which is just, oh. I didn't think that was possible. Yeah. Struess was the guy, again, remember, Sepp, who hit that huge shot in, what was it, game three? In game three, right. And he hasn't hit a shot since. Right. And that's, I was going to say, that was the last shot he hit. Did he think the series was over? Do you think it was a two out of three or whatever? Because <laughs> the last two games, he's been horrible. Kyle Lowry looks like he's aging in dog years. I mean, he's he's obviously injured and was never a guy who was in great shape. So that backcourt is a disaster. I would play Gabe Vincent a lot more. Heck, I'd play Gabe Kapler a lot more if he was available. <laughs> I mean, there's just no reason to keep playing Lowry and Struess as many minutes as they have. Actually, Gabe Vincent's been their best backcourt guy the entire series. One of their more consistent players. Um, Miami was 7 of 45 from three-point land on uh, Wednesday night. You're not going to win many games or any games when you shoot seven of 45, which is a little bit above 15%. Heck, Clay Thompson in game five last night for Golden State went eight of 16 from three-point territory. Ooh, yep, so he had one uh, more okay. made three-point <laughs> yeah, than, than what Miami was able to have on Wednesday night. So I, it, it is set up for the Celtics to take care of business. And let's hope they continue to show that maturity that you've talked about, that they have matured this year, but occasionally they'll have this slip up. But they've got to go ahead, take care of business tonight, wrap this thing up so they don't have to go back to Miami for game seven. And this would give them ample time to rest up, try to get Marcus Smart, Rob Williams healthier and give you plenty of time to prep for the finals, which begin Thursday in San Francisco. I mean, that's a huge difference. Five days of preparation rather than three days of preparation and also an extra couple of days to get these guys at least closer to full health going into the finals. Yeah, absolutely. And Sep, that's another reason why, you know, I'm again, I'm the paranoid Celtics fan it, it, it is worried about this game because that rest is so important, especially now that we know it's going to be Golden State. And once we have our finals matchup secured, we're going to do a, you know, a big finals preview. I'll talk about this more in earnest, but just briefly, I think that Rob Williams is going to be the Celtics most important player if they, if they advance and play Golden State, that's something that Golden State can't really counter. Um, so I, the Celtics, I think, really need to get him right. But why I'm saying I'm still paranoid about this is because, you know, you have Draymond Green after the show, after the, sorry, the, the Warriors win last night going on uh, NBA on TNT and saying, you know, we're going to play Boston and, you know, all these talking heads and everybody here in the city are already, you know, talking about the finals and stuff like that. There's... There's more pressure, obviously, on the Heat tonight because if they lose, they're out. But there's a lot of pressure on the Celtics, app, you know, because of all this talk that's going on with people saying, you know, the series is over, they're headed to the finals. Uh, they're already, you know, talking about, oh, Larry Bird's going to be in the building tonight, handing out that, you know, the Larry Bird Award for the first time ever. Steph Curry won the Magic Johnson Award for the first time ever last night. So if the Celtics aren't able to win this game, suddenly – that game seven, there's just a, almost like a crippling amount of pressure on them on the road in Miami. So uh, Miami, again, they, they've definitely looked, like you said, they look sort of shot. But to say that they're not capable of winning two games in a row and shooting better than what they did last game, 
in the game before that, I, I think that that's getting ahead of yourself to say, all right, this is 100% over. Miami has given up. I, I just don't think that's in their makeup. And I think that they can still, even though you're saying Butler is hurt, Lowry's hurt. We don't know what the situation was with, with Tyler, Tyler Hero. Uh, I still think that they have the ability to, to play much better, even with those guys being hurt, than they did the past two games. Since they scored 39 points in the first quarter of game three, they've scored 232 points, which is an average of 21 points points per quarter, which extrapolates out to 84 points per game. I mean, the last two games, they scored 82 and 80 points. And again, they're challenged on offense. If the Celtics take care of the basketball, there's really not a lot of ways that Miami's going to score. They rely so much on creating turnovers and then scoring in transition, something they really haven't been able to do the last two games. So the Celtics take care of the basketball. They'll be in just fine shape. And again, getting out to an early lead and getting the crowd into it. And then at some point, Miami maybe just looks at each other and says, it's not our year. You know, they're better than us. I think everyone's in agreement. The Celtics are the better team. The danger is if somehow Miami comes in and steals a win, now it's a winner-take-all game seven in Miami, even though you've all played them over the first six games of this series, Miami would have a puncher's chance. So that's why it's imperative to wrap this thing up tonight, get Williams, Smart, the rest of the guys some rest and preparation for a Golden State team that looks pretty darn healthy and pretty scary right now uh, after wrapping up their series against the Dallas Mavericks in five games. So wrapping this thing up tonight is imperative. Now, the last two times the Celtics had a 3-2 lead in going into game six of the Eastern Conference Finals, was 2012 against Miami, 2018 against Cleveland. The difference there is those teams had LeBron James, who, by the way, in game six and seven in 2012, six and seven in 2018 averaged 40 points, 14 rebounds, and seven assists a game in those four games. Miami doesn't have anything close to that. In fact, I don't know if their starting right. lineup could score 40 points tonight because they actually had 18 points in game four. I mean, the Celtics are better than this team without question. I mean, I almost talked myself into saying, well, Miami's talent is close to the Celtics. Celtics are better, but it's close. But after watching the last two games, the Celtics are better, period. I, I agree. And I, you know, I, I, you and I both picked the Celtics in this series. So we obviously, we, we felt that way too. And I think that through uh, five games, it's, it's shown up to be the case that the Celtics talent is better than the heats and granted, you know, the heat do are hurt, but we, you know, the Celtics are hurt too. It's, it's not like the Celtics are the healthier team by any stretch. You know, they've had Rob Williams, miss games, Marcus smart myth, miss games, um, Jason Tatum has been banged up. Uh, Horford missed the first game with COVID. So, you know, the Celtics, well, by no stretch of the imagination, are healthy. I mean, Butler is obviously playing with something, although I still have this conspiracy theory that something happened at halftime of game three because his play from that point forward has been atrocious. I mean, he, he I like doesn't it. even I look like a good, a good player. Theory. <laughs> Did he flip out at Eric Spolstra? Was he upset the way they ended the second quarter? Because you remember – Miami was up 26 points late in the second quarter, and the Celtics went on an 11-0 run at the end of the second quarter to cut it to 15, and then they made it a game and came within one point in the fourth quarter. I don't know, did Butler at halftime say something to Spolstra? Who knows what happens? You're not going to hear it. Miami's a pretty buttoned-up organization. I don't know right. what happened. But something happened to Jimmy Butler, and he's done this before. I mean, is is oh yeah, you're not is? you're not just speculating without any no. sort of prior information here. No, I mean he's. Remember, he checked out of a series against the Celtics back in was it 2016, I believe, when Chicago won the first two games in Boston, and then the Celtics came back, and won the next four, two in Chicago, and then took care of business. Yeah, was it was. Team. I think it was longer ago than that. Was it? Was it Rondo on that team? Sap. On, Rondo or, was on that team. I think yeah. it was 2016. He was, it was 16 he missed the first 15, two games, right? And then he came right, back and, and they won. He, and he kind of just checked out. I mean, he does that from time to time. He's an emotional player and. That can work both ways, you know, where you come out like he did in the first two games and look like an all NBA player. And then since then, he's looked anything but that. So I don't know what's up with him. And look, Bam Adebayo is a really good player. But when he sees Rob Williams, he turns into something else. He turns into like a puddle. And, you know, as long as Rob Williams is just out there tonight, even if he's not that active, I think he's just in Bam Adebayo's head. and, And that may be enough to get him out of his game. And then again, that backboard is just a disaster for Miami. And then we'll see about Tyler Hero. I mean, he, Tyler Hero is the sixth man of the year, averaged 21 a game. He has, didn't have a really good series leading up to this. Maybe there was something going on beforehand. He didn't play that well in the first two rounds. But, you know, he is the guy who's quite explosive enough to go out and get 25 points. It's what's they going to need because they're averaging 80 for the last 11 quarters, you know, uh, almost three games. 
Yeah, it's awful. Uh, but I uh, sap, you know, you, you completely n- hit the nail on the head. And this is what we've been saying all series long is that if the Celtics don't turn the ball over, they win. It's simple as that, you know, is sometimes you don't have to go into all these different analytics to figure out why or how to win a basketball game. Um, it, it, Miami, we said this going into the last game, Sap, they're extremely reliant on creating points off turnovers they need to have 15 plus points off of turnovers to win a game they 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 cannot score enough without that and when you limit your turnovers you limit Miami's ability to be any sort of productive offensive team uh, Miami no plays fast because they know that's how they have to score you see them running off of make made baskets not a lot of teams do that and um Miami does and and it, they are successful with it a lot of the times too because once they're into the half court as you said they're they're a terrible half court team this isn't news we knew this going into the series and, and teams know this is about Miami for the first two rounds they were able to overcome it but if you force them to play in the half court all game long and you limit your turnovers they really 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 struggle to crack a hundred points and in the NBA in 2022, not being able to score a hundred points is pretty rare, but that's the way Miami's team is constructed. They're defense first team. They rely on these turnovers, but if a team is more buttoned up and doesn't turn the ball over Miami, it faces long odds to win a game. And the strange thing is jet, they were the number one, three point shooting team this year in the NBA, 38%, but transition doesn't necessarily mean layups, right? You can force a turnover get down the court, set up your offense, and now you've got some open threes. We're going to see that in the finals with Golden State. They do that at a very high rate. Again, they have knockdown shooters in Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and Jordan Poole and a bunch of other guys. So it doesn't necessarily mean turnovers lead to layups. I mean, this isn't the Showtime Lakers where Magic would get the turnover, lead it down the court, and you'd have Worthy on one wing and Byron Scott on the other wing and magic could take it to the cup or, you know, dish to those guys. And, and you, you had that fast break basketball. Now you get a turnover, you get a quick three because the defense can't set up. That's why it's imperative. Keep the turnovers low and also do a better job of not bitching to the referees. That's, that's a weakness of Jason Tatum. Mostly yeah. uh, Grant Williams and um, you know, uh, well, Daniels Heiss, hopefully we don't see him play tonight, but uh, Tatum you can put up with because he's a great player. I mean, when Grant Williams is constantly bitching and moaning, it's like, dude, you're a, you know, a nice role player. Just get back on defense where that's where your value is. If you could just do those types of things and stay out of bad habits, you should be fine against this Miami team because they, they do need to create turnovers to get that offense going. Right. The last thing I I, I want to say about, um, this this past game, you know, game five for the Celtics before we we move on to the Warriors sap is that something I noticed in the in the post game press conference from Ime Odoka, And I think I tweeted this out as well. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it, too. They were asking Ime Odoka what was, you know, the big what really spurred Jalen Brown in the second half because he was dreadful in the first half. You and I were texting back and forth. I mm-hmm. think he had four turnovers in the first quarter. He just it, it looked like, you know, like a baby giraffe trying to take its first steps. <laughs> uh, it was it was that bad. Um, and Imiodoka said he stopped turning the ball over simple as that. Mm -hmm. And what Mm -hmm. I really liked about that, because, you know, he said the same thing to Jalen Brown, Hey, Jalen, stop turning the ball over. You know, you're, you're costing us points. You're, you're going to cost us this game. if You keep doing that. This is the difference between Imiodoka and Brad Stevens. We all know if you've listened to this show at all, that I'm, I'm, I'm not a big Brad Stevens fan. Brad Stevens, when they would ask us, ask him in press conferences, you know, what happened with Jalen Brown, what happened to Jason Tatum, Mark Smart, whoever, what happened with the team, he would dance around the question and make excuses, this sort of thing. You know, some of our shots just didn't go and stuff like that. I like that Emi Odoka is very direct and can identify, okay, this was the problem. One, that gives me confidence that the coach knows what the hell he's talking about because anybody with eyes could see, okay, turnovers are killing the Celtics in the first quarter. That, that was killing the Celtics. And two, I think that the Celtics under Brad Stevens, especially the past couple of years, really lacked self-accountability. And this is what I said in my tweet, more or less, Sap, was that accountability is not the same as criticism. When Imiodoka is saying, stop turning the ball over, he's not necessarily criticizing Jalen Brown. He's giving him more accountability. When you, If you want to become a better player or better at any, any sort of skill, you need to be able to first recognize what your shortcomings or your mistakes are, and then you're able to improve on them. But if you pretend like nothing's wrong, 
then how are you ever supposed to get better or grow? And so that's something that I noticed in the Imudoka's press conference. And that's something that has been a, a, a recurring theme with him throughout the season. And I think that is really important for why the Celtics are now at the precipice of reaching the NBA finals is because he's given them more accountability than they had under Brad Stevens. The thing about Ime Adoka is he played in the league. He was a marginal player, but he played on the San Antonio Spurs, among other teams. He coached under Popovich. He's been around a while. So I think he has the cachet to bring those types of things up to players. He's also a fairly good sized guy, right? At like six, six. I'm not calling him intimidating, but he may be. I mean, he's a, he's a good sized guy. I think when he approaches a player, the player is like going to listen. He's not going to just brush it on eye level, at least. Right. They're on eye level. Right. And, and here's a guy who I think has a lot of confidence in his ability. So that's a good thing as well. And look, I like Brad Stevens a lot. I think his first five or six years here, he did a fantastic job, but you nailed it back in the 2018, 2019 season. We have to see how Brad Stevens is with a loaded roster. He wasn't that good. He was much better with, you know, the Bridgies, where they didn't have as much talent, but he got the most out of them. I also think he's done a good job as president of basketball operations, formulating a team, a roster better than Danny Ainge. Danny Ainge knows talent better than Brad Stevens, but I think Brad Stevens showed us in his first year that he knows how to construct a team that's going to fit together better. But back to Ime Adoka, I think that that's a great point, and that's something that he's been able to do right from the get-go. I mean, I think the first game they lost this season, he talked about how they were getting punked by the Toronto Raptors. Like, who says that in his that's first right. game as an NBA coach? That's pretty darn good. And I also like the way after a timeout, he'll call a timeout, he'll come out to the court, and he'll kind of pick one player that he talks to. He doesn't show them up. You can't do that in today's NBA. It just doesn't work. And again, a lot of times with, you know, and again, I'm, I'm a, a baby boomer. I'm 59 years old. I'm at the tail end of the baby boomers, but I'm a baby boomer. But the, the, the you know, millennials, Gen Zers, who I love. I mean, you're a millennial. You're one of my best friends. I've got a ton yep. of friends. My niece, her husband, everybody's a millennial. I think you, you're an awesome generation. But with millennials and especially Gen Zers, you got to give them a compliment sandwich, right? So you got to give them a compliment first. Then the criticism or the constructive criticism, and then another compliment. I so think you, you're right. They, we struggle with criticism. It's it's a fair. It's everyone a fair point. does, Jet. I do too. So, you know, if someone's got some criticism for me, constructive criticism for me, I don't know why they would have that because I'm pretty much perfect. But the first thing they do is, hey, you know, you're really putting a lot of time in, you're hustling out there. But the thing, Jalen, you got to take care of the basketball, but the effort's fantastic. So now Jalen Brown, the first thing he hears and the last thing he hears is a compliment. But in the middle, the message is take care of the basketball. The amazing thing with Jalen Brown is, and he has the ability to like clean this up. I don't think his handle's all that great. His court vision's not all that great. He's just not oh, a natural, think? and not <laughs> a natural basketball player. Well, the, the crazy thing about Jalen Brown is, and, and you don't see this in today's NBA, in 42 career playoff games, he has as many turnovers as assists. That's not good. Normally, you'd like to see a two to one turnover to assist ratio. That's good. Three to one is, you know, Chris Paul territory, which is outstanding. Um, Jason Tatum the other night had five turnovers, but he had nine assists. Jalen Brown had four turnovers and one assist. Big difference. But he has the ability to clean this up because he's got a really good mid range game. And he's also got a great drive, pull up pop game, which is yes. something not every player has, right? I mean, Jordan had it. Kobe had it. One of the few weaknesses of LeBron James, he never had that simply because he's too darn big. When you're 6'9", 260, you can't start to drive to the basket. Yeah, the moment. In one it's sudden a moment, thing, right? It's a, he's a locomotive. Like, Durant's great at that. I mean, Durant may be the best I've ever seen at that. Uh, Kawhi's great at that. But they're just built differently. LeBron is a giant. I mean, he's Carl Malone size. He can't drive and pull up from 12, 15 feet and just rise above everybody. It's not and that At some point, gravity comes size. into play. <laughs> he's too big, right? But Jalen Brown has that part of his game. We saw that in the second half. So what he's got to do is when he when he catches, either be a catch-and-shoot guy a la Clay Thompson. Now, he's not as good a shooter as Clay, but then again, who is? Or make a quick decision, look like you're going into the lane, read the defense as quickly as you can, but then pull up and then rise above everybody. You've got that in your arsenal. Use it more. He did in the second half. That's why he played better. He was electric in the second half. He, and I give him a lot of credit. Poor first half, excellent second half. That's the sign of growth. He didn't carry over his poor first half into the second half. And he and Tatum were both outstanding in the second half after subpar first halves. And I think that's Sap that goes to, I think Brad Stevens in the same situation would see that and was almost too afraid because he wasn't really their peer to criticize, you know, them and Emi Odoka, however he phrases it, knows how to, you know, 
make it so that he do, Jalen Brown isn't feeling bad about himself, but saying, Hey, you're a great player. You can play better than this. We, I know you can play better than this. I'm not going to bench you or anything like that. I expect you to be able to figure it out. And I think that gives a player confidence. And so when you ignore the problem, like Brad Stevens, I think, especially in his later years, really did ignore a lot of the problems. And you would listen to these press conferences and you'd be like, he's just saying the same things over and over again. He's not talking about anything that's going wrong. Then how, why do you expect the players to necessarily on their own just sort of take accountability? I think that's that's a difficult thing. So I think Jimmy Udoka deserves a lot of credit for it, too. Obviously, Jalen Brown deserves a ton of credit for it, too. And and. Uh, you know, that that's the, the one thing I'll, I'll say as even though I'm paranoid about tonight is I do feel confident that the Celtics know at this point what the formula is to beat the heat. And I think that that's a big growth thing from where they were in the bubble a couple of years ago where they lost to the heat in the bubble is that I don't think they knew how to beat that team. They could look at these past uh, five games and say, OK, here's the here's the formula. We know exactly what we have to do to win this game and win the series. And I think that's a huge thing for them to say, okay, we know we're better than we're more talented. That's a different thing. Knowing how to win a series and knowing what you need to do to beat a team in a game. That's a big, a big thing. And so they figured it out finally against Milwaukee. I think they figured it out to get out Miami, but you know, tonight is going to be, uh, is going to be, a massive game for them in terms of not just in terms of them reaching the final staff, but for them, like I said, at the very top, getting over this hump that they've been, you know, this hill they've been climbing for a little while now. So you look at the growth over the last two seasons, obviously Tatum and Brown are better than they were in the bubble back in 2020. You also have Al Horford on this team who you didn't have two years ago. He's playing in Philadelphia. Grant Williams was really a, a marginal player back then playing just a few minutes. Rob Williams barely played if at all in that series. Uh, you got a player like Derek White who's played really nice basketball the last two games. So you have a better roster filled out. You had kind of a hobbled Gordon Hayward who never really fit in here with Tatum and Brown. Uh, Kemba Walker was a liability on defense. So, you know, it was kind of a mishmash of a roster, maybe a better roster than Miami, but this team's better suited to play against Miami than that one was. And also here's a good thing. And I, I texted you this before we recorded this podcast, Eric Lewis will be refereeing tonight and the Celtics have won 15 straight since Eric Lewis officiated. They've won 15 straight games officiated by Eric Lewis, including eight, no in the playoffs. So he's, he's their binky. He's their, you know, he's their, their uh, lucky guy. So if that carries over, they will be in good shape. And, and Jason Tatum and Grant Williams will still complain just as much, oh, even, you know, oh, regardless man. of who the official is. Um, but uh, Celtics, again, one game away from uh, reaching the NBA finals. But as we said at the top, one team has already punched their ticket. It's the Golden State Warriors. Sap, they win uh, in five games over the Dallas Mavericks. Final score last night was 120 to 110. Um, same sort of story for Dallas. Uh, it was Luka Doncic. And they got some help from, from Spencer Dinwiddie, but uh, not much else there. And Golden State, as they do, uh, have well-rounded effort. Uh, all five of their starters in double figures, Sap and Jordan Poole with 16 off the bench. Um, they obviously look really, really tough right now. And they have that experience of this is, am I correct? This is their sixth finals appearance in the last 80, eight years. Yes. Six and eight. Uh, just like Jordan did six and just eight. Like he won them all. Um, and again, Golden State, like the Celtics, they have the ability to win in multiple fashions, right? You know, the Celtics can win a rock fight, you know, 93 80, like they did in game five over Miami. You can also get into a higher score game and they can win that because they have firepower. Golden State's the same way. Golden State can be electric offensively and they're really good defensively. I think people forget how good they are defensively. You've got Draymond is always a top flight defender. Andrew Wiggins has really grown into a defender because now he's the fourth or fifth best player on that team so he can kind of you know fill in the gaps there rather than being the face of the franchise which he was in minnesota and he's just not cut out to be that guy although i must say jet i'm the one guy that back in 2014 when cleveland drafted him and lebron signed as a free agent with cleveland and they had already had Kyrie irving i said that should be their big three don't trade andrew wiggins for kevin love like i don't know if they would have won one championship with andrew wiggins in four years but lebron may have just stayed there Although I was pretty sure he was wanting to go to L.A. after four years in Cleveland. Um, Wiggins is a guy who can do a lot of things. A really good defensive player, 
versatile offensive player. He's fitting into his nice role now with Golden State. So they've got a myriad of ways of beating you. And then, by the way, Kevon Looney in this series, right? you know, averaging 10 and a half rebounds and 10 and a half points per game. That's like a bonus. You don't expect that now in the next series. And again, I'm putting the Celtics in the finals. I don't expect him to be that productive because Dallas has no resistance in terms of size. Whereas the Celtics with Horford and Rob Williams, I think Kevon Looney may not play as much as he did against Dallas. We'd have to see for that as we preview that potential series, which I think is pretty much a done deal. Uh, but a player like Kevon Looney comes in and plays really well for five games against Dallas. Dallas looks like they kind of gave up, mailed it in at some point the other night. And, you know, they had a nice run getting to the conference finals, but, you know, they need some help to, to break through against a team like Golden State. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, Golden State um, did a great job all series long of controlling the rebound battle. You mentioned Kevon Looney. Last night they won the rebounding battle. 51 to 34. It's amazing that Dallas was within 10 with that big of a rebounding differential sap. So if, you know, whoever ends up playing golden state, you need to make sure that the rebounds are tighter, especially because golden state, not a particularly big team. Um, and you know, they're not going to be, you know, throwing out, you know, lots of seven footers. I don't even know that they have a seven, seven footer on their team. Um, sap. So you need to make that, that more competitive, but, as far as, as uh, the strengths of Golden State, you nailed it. They have a ton of great defensive players um, who are very versatile, um, and they have guys who are very comfortable in their role. We know Steph's comfortable as being the primary scorer in a one. We know Clay Thompson is very comfortable being a number a secondary scorer. We know Draymond mm-hmm. Green's very comfortable doing whatever the hell it is that they ask him to do. Andrew Wiggins is perfectly happy in his role as the third or fourth scorer. Jordan Poole is electric off the bench. We know he can score as a starter, score, score as a bench guy. So they have a bunch of guys who are really playing in their ideal role. And similar to what the Celtics have, and we've talked about this before, that they're so much better when they ask when Grant Williams is the guy who comes off the bench and Peyton Pritchard's the guy who comes off the bench and Rob Williams is the starter and playing in there. So similar to Celtics in that way, Golden State's figured out how to build a roster where you're asking everybody to do what they can do and not ask them to do more. Um, and that's how you become a, a successful team. So they're, they're going to be obviously a very, very difficult team to beat. That being said, just because it's the sixth time they've made the finals in the past eight years, doesn't mean it's the same golden state team that had made the finals all those years prior. This is not that same juggernaut of a golden state warriors team. Right. There's uh, some guy by the name of Kevin Durant, who's no longer with them, right? He with the three straight finals. They won the first two handily over LeBron and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Heck, they won eight out of nine games against LeBron and LeBron played great in those series. But, you know, it was LeBron against the Golden State Warriors. The next time they went to the finals, uh, Durant played, I think, 12 minutes in that series, scored 10 points before he blew out his Achilles. And then Clay got hurt in game six and Clay was having a really good series. I, I, I still think if Durant had been healthy going into that series. They beat Toronto, but he wasn't, and they didn't. You look at the other finals appearances by Golden State. The first time in, they're playing LeBron without Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love. Love got hurt in the first round against the Celtics, and Kyrie got hurt in the first game against Golden State, and it still went six games. Iguodala was the MVP of the finals. LeBron's second best player was Matthew Della Vadova. So, I mean, it wasn't like a a great... (laughs) It's a great accomplishment beating LeBron, no matter who his teammates are, but it's not like he Golden State beat, you know, an all time great team. The next year, Cleveland with LeBron, Kyrie and Love all healthy, come back from the three to one deficit to win it. And then when Durant only plays 10, 12 minutes in a series, they lose to Toronto. Not an all time great team. Again, Kawhi was sensational and, and, you know, they put all their pieces together. So you can look at it and say, yes, they're nearly unbeatable when they had Durant. They were unbeatable when they had Durant, because again, if he had been healthy in that 2019 finals, they would have three-peated without question. The other three times, you know, the other two times they, you know, need a lot of help to beat Cleveland the first time around, and then they lost the second time. And Steph hasn't been great in the finals. I mean, they've won three titles, and he was never really in the discussion for MVP of the finals. I mean, Iguodala won it because he held LeBron to, what, 39, 15, and 8? You know, that, that's yeah, it's good. That's, uh, that's good. Yeah, you hold the best player in the world to 39, 15, and 8. They give you an MVP. Um, and then the other two times, Durant was the guy deserving. So 
Um, Steph has had some struggles in the finals. Remember the fourth quarter of, of game seven in 2016? I think he was one for seven from the floor in the fourth quarter with five turnovers. I mean, he, he's he's awesome. I mean, I, I actually think more highly of him as a player than you do. I don't quite think of him as highly as, say, Christian Burgoyne, uh, our former producer who thinks that, you know, Steph's the best player in the history of the sport. He's not. He's not a top five player. He's not even a top 10 player. Even if they no, I, and I've seen it's getting not. out of control, Steph. You well, know, it, he won it the, always does. He won the made up award last night. You know, the Magic Johnson award that literally wait a was minute, just made wait up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you calling it a made up award because it's named after Magic? But tonight, if they hand it out, it's a real award because it's named yeah. after Larry Bird. Okay. Yes, exactly. I see yeah. where you're coming yeah. from. Uh, I yeah. see where you're coming from. Uh, but he... he And this is what I'm going to say about Golden State as we preview the finals later on, um, you know, in the week. They are a front running team and he's he's chief front front runner. So, oh, yeah, that's that's one criticism. Another criticism I have of Steph Curry. And again, I think he is an all time great. I can't I'd be insane to not say that. But I saw a lot of people tweeting after he won that award last night and they're going to the six finals in eight years. Steph Curry is the best player of this generation. That's crazy. And I know that you don't want to see the Warriors win because it has a LeBron narrative. But if you're yep. if you're at even a marginally objective basketball fan, Steph Curry can win two more titles and he, he still shouldn't even be in the same conversation no. as LeBron, in my mind. So I don't want to hear he's the best player of this generation. No, he's not. It's LeBron. Then it's Durant. Then you can make an argument for him if you want. Then it's to. him. Yeah, I would I would say he's third. Look, if he wins. This year, he'll have two without Durant. You can make that case. I think he's been the most influential player on the court. Right? Not the same I mean, thing, though. Totally different thing. Exactly. Um, you know, he's changed the game more than anyone since probably Will Chamberlain. I mean, they had to change the rules because of Will Chamberlain or because of Bill Russell, the big guys who dominated in their era. But Michael Jordan, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even going to go there with LeBron. No, he's not. Look, I have Steph Curry ranked somewhere between 15th and 18th, certainly a top 20 player. And if he wins this year, maybe goes up a little bit, but top 10 to me is going to be tough to crack. Look, someone could crack into number 10, the top nine in my all time list. I don't really see moving much around there. I've got LeBron one, Jordan two. I'm not going to get into that discussion. Now we've had that before. <laughs> You're not as vehemently against me as a lot of other people. I think when we get Patrick Gilroy on during the finals, that that could, get into a heated conversation. Yeah. I'm against but get, you, but not vehemently. That's that fair. doesn't mean like I'm a crackpot for saying it. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, with Skip Bayless has LeBron like at nine, but I got yeah. LeBron, Jordan. I think they're the two greatest players ever because they did everything. I mean, they defense, offense, led teams, led somewhat inferior rosters to championships. Three for me is Russell because the winning means a lot. Number four is Kareem, the longevity and just the elegance and, and incredible uh, production means a lot. Those are the four guys that I think of the Mount Rushmore basketball. After that, I go Wilt, Magic, Bird, Duncan, Kobe. Those are my top nine. Now I have Oscar Robertson number 10. Look, if Steph wins another one or two titles or Durant wins another one or two titles, they can kind of crack in there at number 10. But just outside my top 10, I've got the likes of Elgin Baylor, who's the most underrated player and overlooked player in the history of the sport. I've got, uh, you know, Jerry West right there, Moses Malone, Shaq. Hakeem Olajuwon, all those great players. Then Durant and Curry right in there, like 16, 17. That's an incredible accomplishment for two guys who still have a lot left to play, right? Yeah. I mean, Durant and Curry are far from over. They can move up there, but let's not just put Curry at in the top 10 because he wins another championship. He's awesome. I get that. But he's those other guys I mentioned, those first nine guys I mentioned, were all bigger players who – we're all better defenders than Steph. Now, Magic and Bird weren't great defenders, but by their sheer size, they're a little better than Steph defensively, who I think gets overlooked somewhat defensively. He's not a really good defensive player. No, Steph exactly. Curry. But here's where he affects the other team is because someone has to chase him for 40 That's minutes true. a he night. He tires him out on, his, on the offensive side. That he player does. is almost useless offensively. Like, if you're going to put Marcus Smart on him in the finals for 40 minutes, and they're not going to do that. They're going to rotate guys. You can't have someone. But No one guards someone no, one-on-one for the whole game no, anymore. That's, no. that's long been since not that's a That's long been gone. And if you are, yeah. the, you better have an ambulance there with an EKG <laughs> because chasing him around is, is incredible. And, look, I think he's phenomenal. He moves better without the basketball than anyone I've ever seen. Um, yeah, and you got to no, pick him I, up full court. Yeah, because it's, I mean, he's in the shooting range at, at mid court. I mean, it's like, you know, Patrick Mahomes, red, you know, red zone is the 50 yard line in. Um, so, although maybe not so with Tyreek Hill now in um, New York Jet, but 
you you look at he's Steph. Not he's not a jet. He's, he's a dolphin. Like, Give him some credit. A dolphin. Steph. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a little out of touch. I'm still pissed <laughs> off that Devontae Adams is a Raider. You know, I can't figure that one out. Like, who the hell needs a wide receiver that good? That's right. Tyree Kill is a dolphin. Thank you for correcting me. But You're you welcome. get my point with Steph is is <laughs> I, I now I earlier said I'm perfect. I'm never wrong. And I just proved that I was wrong. But yeah. no, Steph is fantastic. But let's let's hold back. I mean, is he better than Kobe Bryant? Come on. No, no. Seriously. No. I mean, Kobe. Not, no. The the two final titles that Kobe won really elevated him. Yes. Um, in, in I think in my mind, and a lot of people are like that roster was not all that good. I mean, Paul Gasol, no. Hall of Famer. Yeah. I I I would because more of the international in. stuff. But like very borderline, Lamar Odom absolutely no. not. Andrew Bynum had maybe one good year of basketball. Ron Artest, great defensive player, wasn't in the prime of his career by the time he got to the Lakers. You know that Jordan. They had who else the hell they have on that Derek team? Derek Fisher. Jordan, I mean Jordan Farmar, uh, Sasha yeah. Vujacic. Uh, yep. No, good hair though. Th- th- really good hair. Those those elevated Kobe in a massive way. Steph yes. has never played on a team that's been since maybe the first year or two of his career. That's been that devoid of a, a, you know, of talent as you know, those Kobe two last Kobe championship teams. That's what's holding him back. It, it's not necessarily Steph's fault. It's not, not even necessarily, it's not Steph's fault that they put right. a great team around him, you know, good for them. Good for him. I'm sure he would want any other way. But there becomes a, a, a hard cap or a ceiling that comes with playing on great teams perennially that you at some point can't elevate yourself any further. I, I, I That's how I look at it. Yeah, you're kind of there. Like my guys, Aaron Rodgers in football. I mean, if he wins the next two Super Bowls, he's still not going to surpass Tom Brady. I think he'll move into like third or fourth as the greatest quarterback of the Super Bowl era. I think he's fifth right now, but you get you can only go so far. The same right, more so it's basketball, right? Is it's that oh, you yeah, have to tough. look it's you have really to look tough. at context. At one, exactly, who you, yep. who you beat in the finals. I think yep. that's massively important. And two, what your team looked like when you won. LeBron, you know, he his legacy was elevated the most when he he won that that title coming back from three games to one. Because that, that team like wasn't titles. all that that team wasn't yeah. all that good. They were fine. But he beat an all-time great team. So those two things combined really elevate him. I, if if the if the Celtics make the finals and the Warriors drub them, because I think most people think there's a pretty good Celtics team, that will certainly help Steph Curry and he wins finals MVP. The finals MVP will help elevate him more because he hasn't he doesn't have that yet. So he has that room yep. to grow. But until and unless he's ever on a team that's looked at as uh, you know, it's a it's a fine team, it's not loaded. He's he's got a finite cap on him on how far right. he can go. Yeah. And I, I don't see that this roster is going to get bad around him any chance. I mean, maybe Draymond retires at some point and he's clearly not at the height of his powers, but he's still really, really good. And clay looks like he's working himself back. And then they have these young guys like pool um, Moody and um, your guy coming. Yeah. And, and so, and, and, you know, those guys are going to obviously improve. And so I, I don't see that Curry is ever going to have a situation where he's on a bum team for the rest of his career. Yeah, and he's never going to have Russell Westbrook on his team like LeBron. And I don't think he's leaving. <laughs> no, no. And, and again, they've built that culture where I don't think anybody's leaving. And they're not afraid to blow by the tax, right? They'll they'll spend all the money they need to keep the team together and, and try to improve it. And, you know, back to Kobe Bryant in that sense. And I think Kobe sometimes gets a little overrated because, and look, man, he rested in he's peace. He's a Laker. He's a Laker. And, and, you know, when they keep putting him in the argument with LeBron and, and Michael Jordan, I think he's below those guys. But that's a no, it's too many discussion. people have him in their top five. That's crazy. It's, way too many people have him in their top way too five. many. Yeah. I mean, is, is he better than Kareem? No. Is he better than Russell? No. I mean, Chamberlain won two titles, but the numbers are just, I don't care who he was playing against. And is he better than bird magic? I saw all three of those players, entire careers, bird magic and Kobe and, and magic and bird are better than Kobe, not by a lot, but by enough. But the thing about Kobe Bryant was in the 2010 finals game seven, he shot six of 24 from the floor. He went out and got 14 rebounds. If Steph's not shooting, do you think I Steph's hate that you keep bringing up rebounds? that game? No, but I know, I know. <laughs> Believe me, I was rooting for the Celtics in that situation. I'm, I, I root for the Lakers when they had Magic Johnson and when they got LeBron James. I mean, I'm rooting for the Celtics to win this title because I don't want Steph getting that fourth NBA title to equal LeBron. And I got to hear about that nonsense that he's the best player of his generation when at best 
he's tied for second with Durant, although Durant's a better player. I mean, he's a nine inches taller, size matters. But Kobe did get 14 rebounds in that game. Do you think if Steph goes six for 24 from the floor and look, he had a bad shooting night in game seven against the Cavaliers in 2016, he didn't get any 14 rebounds. That's what Kobe can do. And Kobe can also go down the other end and shut people down. Steph can't do that stuff. He's, he's phenomenal. He's the most influential player since Chamberlain and Russell on the court, off the court. Jordan's in a class by himself, yeah. but yeah, I mean, let's, let's not get crazy. I mean, people top five player of all time. It's like, no, no, he's, I think he's the second or third best point guard behind magic. And I don't know what we're classifying Oscar Robertson as, you know, he was a point guard, but a big one back in the day. So uh, this is why I hope the Celtics win. So we don't have to have that silly discussion of Steph Curry's a top five player and the best player of his generation because it's nonsense. So Sap, last question. And again, we're going to have a much more extensive finals preview once we have it locked in. What's, what's the weakness of the goal, this version of the Golden State Warriors as a team. You talked about Steph Curry individually. What's what's their weakness? Do they have an Achilles heel? Because again, it's not the juggernaut Warriors. It's a really no. good team. They are fully capable of winning the title this year, but they must have some weakness, Sap. Lack of size, right? But like you pointed out, they out rebounded Dallas. They out rebounded them in game five, 51 34. That's a wide margin, but Dallas is not a great rebounding team. They don't have much size either. I do think against the Celtics that Golden State, lack of size, will, will challenge them. Uh, Rob Williams, Al Horford, the Celtics are big. Uh, you know, Grant Williams is a moose, and, and Tatum and Brown are long wings. Marcus Smart's a big point guard. I mean, this is a big team, right? I mean, a big physical team that went toe-to-toe against maybe the most physical team in the league in Milwaukee, and we know Miami. Oh, they're the most physical team physical. in the league. <laughs> Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Giannis is the most physical player because he's like a wrecking ball, not to mention Lopez and, you know, the Portis and the rest of those guys, even their guards are like linebackers, right? You know, Drew Holiday, you know, could go to the NFL combine and get drafted as a, a strong safety. Um, but the Celtics are big and physical too, and I think that that could be the weakness of Golden State, that the sheer size – could be a problem. And the Celtics do defend threes. Now the challenge here is Golden State's got a bunch of three point shooters. And if they're healthy, that's going to be a challenge. I mean, Miami has been depleted because you don't have hero the last couple of games and their three point shooters have, have been really poor. Part of that is good defense by the Celtics. Part of it though, is just poor shooting by Miami. So I think the Celtics, if they can take advantage of that size difference, the physicality that they have over Golden State, that that can be a big part of beating them. If the Celtics don't end up winning this series, Sap, I'll never forgive you for jinxing them, by the way. Mm. That's just how it's going to go. Not the only one, Jet. Everyone is aware of that. To the finals. I know. I'm aware and of that. And you got Eric Lewis officiating tonight again. 15 straight wins with Eric Lewis as their official, including 8 0 in the postseason. So Eric yeah. Lewis will take care of business tonight. I'm just glad, like you said, that, that, that you know, LeBron James isn't on the uh, other side of the court tonight. And that's, and that's why. I have so much respect for LeBron James and, you know, and push back on people who you know, like skip. And even though I don't put him as the greatest player of all time, it's like he did it to my team. I've seen right. it happen too much. And that's why, again, this is the worst, the dumbest argument against LeBron is calling him not clutch. Like what's more clutch than in, in games where he was facing eliminations, putting up 40 and 50 points. Like, I- I'm sorry, that's clutch. I don't care that he, if he didn't do it in the last five seconds of a game, when you put up a 40 point, you know, 15 rebound, 15 assist effort in an elimination game on the road, you're a clutch player. That period. That's how it goes. His game seven numbers are ridiculous. I mean, they're like 36, 10, and nine. Or his it, it was a, and he's like, and it was he's an like okay argument. The first, days. the first like three years of his career, it was an okay argument. Once he started, but even then, off, though. But even it's then, when he got to the now. 07 finals, he beat a really good Detroit team, a little past their prime. But we saw what he did in game five against Detroit when he scored, what, 28 straight points for the Cavaliers? Yeah. Got and to the finals. Was one of, is, oh. No, not one of. I think oh. it was the worst roster to ever reach an NBA finals. That or the question. 76ers in 2001. Right. Yeah. Or two, yeah. Awful. At least they had, a, they had a second Hall of Famer in Matumbo. Now he was, you know, he past was 58. His prime. That's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Shaq almost dunked him into the basket. On several occasions. But yeah, then 2011 was the meltdown. And of course, that's what Skip Bayless continually brings up. Since that meltdown against Dallas in 2011, the guy has gone to eight finals and won four of them. So I think he's kind of recovered from that. Let's move on. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a stupid argument. I, one, I really dislike it because, you know, it, it also when you're arguing, as I would argue that Jordan's the greatest player ever, as mm-hmm. you know, when you're when you're arguing 
for Jordan and you make a stupid argument saying LeBron's not clutch, that makes your argument weaker because it makes you look exactly. like you don't know what you're talking about. So that's yep. that's what it frustrates me. But anyways, moving on. Last segment, Sap. Not basketball. We wanted to uh, we love mo- you and I are both huge movie fans, love movies. And uh, we wanted to pay our respects to um, Ray Liotta, who passed away uh, sadly yesterday at the age of 67. And um, not just share our condolences, but uh, also our uh, our favorite Ray Liotta movies. And Sap, as a uh, fellow Paisan, I will let you start. Yeah, I mean, Goodfellas obviously is his best film, right? I mean, the one he's most famous for. Uh, Something Wild was his breakthrough role. Then he also had a very important role playing Shoeless Joe Jackson in Field of Dreams. And then after Goodfellas, you know, he never was in another Scorsese film, which is a surprise because Scorsese has a tendency of putting the same actors in all of his films. He's very comfortable with them. Obviously, De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio are the most famous and the two greatest actors he's worked at. Leota's not at that level. May he rest in peace. But Joe Pesci's been in a lot of movies and a lot of those character actors. And then, you know, Copland, I thought was a really, really good film. Uh, The Place Beyond the Pines was a real sleeper back in Mm. 2012, starring Ryan Gosling, who's one of my favorite actors, his significant other in real life, the lovely Eva Mendez, and also Bradley Cooper, really good crime movie. Leota played um, a police detective. He was really good in that. And he started to segue into not just playing like, you know, uh, sociopaths or or mob figures and started playing other roles. Uh, He also was in Blow with Johnny Depp. I mean, he just was a very, very good actor uh, who, by the way, hated Henry Hill. I heard a story that uh, Ray Liotta was on a, a radio station doing an interview and they surprised him by having Henry Hill called in. And he was absolutely pissed and just kind of walked out at the end of the segment and didn't even say goodbye to the radio host because Henry Hill, I guess, was on the set of Goodfellas and he was constantly trying to correct Ray Liotta and it just irritated him. It's like, I work for Martin Scorsese. This is a film. You know, we don't have to. This is not a documentary about Henry Hill. It's a it's a great motion picture. And, you know, just get out of my face. And, you know, I think that that kind of irritated him. But Goodfellas is his his best film. I think we're both in agreement on that pretty much handily. Yeah, uh, without a doubt, and that's in I'd say probably my top ten all time movies. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, yeah, that's it's almost a perfect movie if you can really have is. such a thing. Um, yeah, the, Henry Hill. I remember I used to listen to Howard Stern every morning, uh, and my mom was a huge Howard Stern fan. And when she would drive mm-hmm. to school, we'd listen to Howard Stern on the radio. And I remember Henry Hill constantly calling in as he was a frequent guest of that program. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, Ray Liotta. Um, was was never though nominated for an Oscar, I don't believe, Sap. No, he wasn't. And again, I, I don't want to disparage the dead. He was a very good actor, but I don't know. I mean, he could have got nominated for Goodfellas, which didn't win Best Picture that year. Um, Dances with Wolves won over Goodfellas. Goodfellas, I think, a better film than Dances with Wolves. Scorsese didn't win Best Director. Pesci did win Best Supporting Actor. De Niro didn't get nominated for that. That was more about the director and the ensemble cast than anything and the story and the writing and and everything. As you said, it's, it's close to a perfect film, but no, he was never nominated. Um, He got to work with really great directors, including Jonathan Demme who directed him in something wild. Jonathan Demme passed away a few years ago, um, directed the silence of the lambs and also Philadelphia, you know, one of the best directors that, of his generation for sure. So um, yeah, Ray Liotta never got nominated and it became kind of just that working character actor, which I think a lot of guys like being like Christopher Walken, who was a star became that as well. And you, you kind of live a life where you just go out, make a lot of money, make films and, and you're not the guy that, you know, is going to get hounded by the paparazzi, right? You Like Ray Liotta was a star, but he wasn't this mega star that people were going to, you know, hound like say Johnny Depp or, you know, Tom Hanks or Tom Cruise or, or stars at that level, but a great career, but just so sad at 67 to pass away uh, far too young. Yeah. I, I think um, I was, I was trying to find the tweet. Um, somebody that uh, I work with, not a particularly big fan of, but uh, somebody who does know movies uh, said that Ray Liotta is in the top five best actors to never be nominated. Sure. Yeah, I could go with that. I think the one that never got nominated that may be the best is Donald Sutherland, who's a Kiefer Sutherland's dad. Who's I don't a, who's know the whole list off the top of my head. So yeah, you'd have to tell that's me. A pre- that's a pretty good one. Yeah, I think I think Donald Sutherland's right there. Short, certainly Ray Liotta would be there. I'm trying to think. I mean, he said the best that his was John Cazale. 
John Cassell never got nominated. He was only in five films. Listen to the five films he was in. The Godfather, The Godfather Part Two, The Conversation, The Deer Hunter, and Dog Day Afternoon. All five of those films nominated for Best Picture. Three won Best Picture, both The Godfather, The Godfather Part Two, and The Deer Hunter. He was only in five films. That, now, that's, was he, would you pretty say good. He, was, he was the Robert Ori of those sort of things? Yeah, where he was probably, along for the ride, yeah. or were they be great? No, he was good. <laughs> I mean, he, was, he played Fredo. He played Fredo, which was a key role in The Godfather. The conversation of those five films is one that probably very few people ever saw. Did you ever see The Conversation? No. Great movie. Great movie. Uh, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, Gene Hackman. It's actually Gene Hackman's favorite role. It's it's phenomenal. Uh, the Deer Hunter, obviously, is an American classic. And Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino. The interesting thing about John Cazale is he was born in Revere, Mass. And I believe he's buried in Arlington, Mass. I mean, he was a Massachusetts guy. He died... At 40, 42, uh, they were filming The Deer Hunter and he was diagnosed with a disease. It was terminal and they didn't want to have him on the set. They, they mm. didn't think they could ensure him to you know, play the role. And Robert De Niro, the star of the movie, spoke up and said, no, we need him for this role and I'll, I'll you know, guarantee it. And then Meryl Streep, who was his then girlfriend, you know, stayed and cared for him. Uh, John Cassell, he's, he's right there. I mean, the, the five films I just named, and those are the only ones he was in, are like all time greats. I mean, he's he's it's like James like Dean, Robert he's Ori. Good. Yeah, he's overrated, but that's I know you're kind of named after him, aren't you? Come Ori? on, Sap. I know, I know. I'm sorry. You're, you're I mean, really you know frustrating what? Frustrating me at the end of this show, trying to jinx the Mar- Celtics, disparaging the he, great James Dean. He was a wannabe. He wanted to be Marlon Brando and Montgomery Clift, and they kind of laughed at him. But no, he was obviously a superstar. But yeah, again, a lot of times when an actor dies at a very young age or a player has a really short career, we have a tendency to overrate them. So that, you know, like Gail Sayers is apparently the greatest running back ever because he was injured and had a short career. You know, Jim Brown was the greatest running back ever. But I get, I get the point. But um, what were the other actors on there that were never nominated? That, were on uh, that list? Donald Sutherland, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, Meg yeah. Ryan. Good choice. Good choice. Good actress. Uh, Jim Carrey. That shocks me. He should have been nominated for a couple of films. But he was never I been mean, nominated. Yep. Wow. That's weird because he's sensational. Uh, who else is in? This is just a list compiled by uh, uh, Yard Barker, a blog. Um, Steve Buscemi. Another great actor, great character actor that, you know, I mean, The Sopranos obviously was in a film, not an Oscar nomination, but I'm sure he had you know, Emmys for that. But yeah, that, I mean, he was in Fargo. That's probably his mm-hmm. most famous film. Meh. Well, I know you don't like that. I love that film. That That's a big disagreement we have. No, that's uh, movie I'm, I'm trying to think to uh, the other, the other, um, I got a bunch more names for you. If you want them, go so. ahead. Yeah. Why not? All right. Jamie Lee Curtis, mm-hmm. Steve Martin, yeah. another one, Steve Martin and Jim Carrey both should have been nominated. Steve Martin didn't get nominated. Here's the thing about Steve Martin. All of me is a great film. He won the New York Film Critics Best Actor of the Year Award, but didn't even get nominated for an Oscar. And Jim Carrey for Pleasantville, don't you think he deserved to be nominated for that? Or one of his many Uh, great performances? I mean, Truman Show. I always confuse those two. Truman Show, of course he should have got nominated for that. But look, the Oscar nominations, they always push back against what are considered comedians, although Robin Williams had several Oscar nominations, deservedly so. And I think Jim Carrey and... um, Steve Martin are in that, you know, in that pantheon of great comedic actors. Most people say being comedic actors harder than being a dramatic actor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Mia Farrow, John Turturro, uh, Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen, right. Yeah, the, the, these are all phenomenal actors that never. John Goodman, who is that? Oh, John Goodman man. Is a fantastic actor. Al Pacino. Um, they did Sea of Love together in the late 80s. And Al Pacino, they asked Al Pacino, who's your favorite actor? Who do you think is the best actor out there? He says, John Goodman. And, and the more you watch John Goodman, you're like, I kind of get it. The guy's phenomenal because he can play anything. Um, yeah, that, these are a, lo- a lot of the rest of them are, you know, modern ones who have, you know, probably are going to be nominated at some point. Um, and then another one, they have Bruce Willis is another guy who's never been nominated. Yeah, The Sixth Sense, I thought he was really good. Unbreakable, he was good. I mean, Die Hard's not Pulp the Fiction. Type of movie that's going to get Pulp Fiction, you know, supporting actor. But uh, Die Hard's not going to get Oscar nominations for acting, but he was darn good in it. And I, I like to see Oscar expand a little bit, you know, to more comedies. And look, 
an action movie can be good. Uh, I, I was really happy, and I, and I mentioned Jonathan Demi earlier in the show. I mean, The Silence of the Lambs won Best Picture. That's it not did. a classic Best Picture, but it was the Best Picture that year. Deserved, you know, deserved all the Oscars it got. So, yeah, that's a pretty good list. A pretty um, amazing so, list. So, and Ray Liotta, obviously, as we said, was on that list too, and uh, yeah. sadly, again, yesterday passed away. So, uh, although he does sap have two movies coming out that he has finished filming, so two more mm-hmm. movies. That will be in his uh, filmography. We'll see uh, what what they are and what his performances are like. But uh, certainly he'll be most remembered for, like you said, Goodfellas and Field of Dreams. Um, uh, you know, he, those movies were actually back to back, Sap, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Field of Dreams was 1989. And I saw that on my 26th birthday. That's how old I am. I was I turned 26, April 25th, 1989. Saw that movie. Loved it. Every time I've tried to watch it again, I can't get through it. There's two movies that I loved. On is the it first not, viewing, it, why is it not good? I haven't seen it since the first time I saw it. Which you know, yeah, I was a it just kid. Did, it it didn't really resonate with me after that. I was like, okay, this is a little bit hokey, and or a lot hokey. And then the other one was Forrest Gump. The first time I saw it, I loved it. I went back. You know, if I love a film, I'll see it many times. The second time, I couldn't get through it. Those are the two films mm. that I had that um, experience with. But uh, yeah, and then something wild is something that you you should see. Uh, that was his first hit back in 1986 copland's really good and the place beyond the pines is really really good i mean it's a long watch it's about two hours and 40 minutes but it's a good crime drama and look i'm a huge ryan gosling fan i thought well i have a man crush on ryan gosling who doesn't <laughs> yeah you have for a while i remember you <laughs> oh lord the perfect man i yeah. remember i remember we went to see uh la la land i went with my niece and her husband and after the movie my niece turned to her husband and said i m- could leave you for him <laughs> like that was like, and she's not like that. She's not, you know, like one of those type of people, but she said, I, I could see myself leaving him for you. And I said, right. yeah, I, I, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't love Ryan Gosling? I mean, he's, he's pretty talented, <laughs> could sing, act, dance, great looking guy. And it seems like a pretty cool guy as well. Like, you know, pretty well grounded. He's been with Eva Mendes for over a decade. Not bad. Not bad. Mm-hmm. Your part, your life partner. Yes. There you go. Uh, Ryan Gosling. I'm sure he is pretty hot to trot for me. I'm yeah, a good catch. Sounded like Donald Trump right there at the end. <laughs> Ryan Gosling. Tremendous, you always have to, you have to say the name at the end, too. Right. Tremendous. He's a, Ryan Gosling. Okay. Tremendous <laughs> guy. Great personal yep. friend of mine. Yep. Um, all right, Sap. Well, that's going to do it for us here at the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Chet and Sap. Thanks to Full Press Coverage for presenting us, as always. Um, make sure you check out our social medias, at John Sap 25 at Jet Stryer. And we will be back. Uh, with hopefully a finals preview next and not a game seven preview sap, uh, which I really, really mm. would like to avoid. And uh, hopefully it's uh yeah, the Celtics Warriors finals preview, but uh, you can find the podcast wherever podcasts are found. Just type in the pick and roll NBA podcast with jet and sap, and we will talk to you later. See everybody.